Mrs. Travers is a very complicated character. I mean, I, I suspect it's, it's hard to kind of figure out where you kind of start to get at somebody like that. The thing, the thing that worried me most was when we make movies, we watch movies, we tend to watch people being not the same. Everyone's got to go on a journey. You know, there's always the arc. Um, <laughs> God, I can't stand it. Anyway, but that we're used to people being morally somehow similar from beginning to end, or they change in a very clear way. And this was not what happened to her at all. I mean, she doesn't suddenly become a nice person at the end of the movie. <laughs> she doesn't suddenly realize even that she loves Ralph. She doesn't realize that there's, a, it, that's not her thing. And she's also fantastically inconsistent. So one minute she's being vile, and then another moment in the, she's actually being quite merry, and or she's dancing, or she's wearing a pink kaftan. Never a good idea, by the way, <laughs> um, particularly with the perm. Um, but, you know, <laughs> she was inconsistent, and I remember one of my early worries was, I wonder if the audience will think that I have just got it wrong and forgotten what she's like <laughs> and just suddenly behaved in a completely different way because I am not doing my job properly. Mm -hmm. There was that. Mr. Sherman, you were able to see this uh, in real life and then through the film itself. I'm curious what that's like uh, to experience it both, both ways. Uh, well, once it was very painful, and the second time it was rather fascinating and enjoyable. Which uh, one was which? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but, you know, I, I kept saying to myself as I was watching uh, real things that were happening uh, done through the, the actors and through the performances and through the script, and I was saying to myself, I wish I had known this script when I was working with Mrs. Travers 50 <laughs> years ago. I would have had a little more understanding of what was going on because... I, all I know is she, she came in, imagine this, you've just taken a very warm, wonderful bath, and you come out of the bath, you feel just great, and somebody comes in with ice water and pours it on you <laughs> right away. Bob and I and Don DeGrati had been working for, for two, two, almost two years on developing this story, and we, we felt we finally got it, and Walt felt we had it, and we had a whole bunch of songs and everything. We were very up, and when we first met Mrs. Travers, we were the happiest guys in the world. We said, we're gonna meet this lady and she's gonna be so happy. And she said, the first thing out of her mouth was, well, I don't even know why I'm meeting you people. I remember we're not gonna do a musical. And you know, it was so, you might say it was much more enjoyable the second time. <laughs> when you started writing, was it always in your mind a story less about a business negotiation than it was about letting go and about the role that art serves in, in uh, somebody's personal life and how they kind of relate to their own art. Yeah, absolutely. It was always, um, for me, it was always going to be a film about forgiveness and the, you know, the effect that our parents have on us as children and how we carry that into our adulthood and how do we let it go. But I, I always wanted it to be about catharsis and letting things go. Um, and I feel like the negotiation between Disney and um, Pamela is actually secondary to that. A lot is known about Walt. A lot is known about this period in his history. How do you kind of embrace that and also set it aside to kind of create the performance that you're looking for? Well, there's so much video footage of Walt Disney um, <clears throat> that it's a treasure trove. Uh, the late uh, Diane Disney Mill, it's lovely to see that up at the, at mm -hmm. the end of the film, by the way, um, gave me complete, total open access to the Walt family Walt Disney Family Museum up in the Presidio in San Francisco. So I was up there twice, and one day it was closed, and they just turned everything on for me, and I spent hours. So I saw every piece of video and heard every piece of audio that's on display up there, as well as had uh, uh, access to tons of videos and an awful lot of uh, uh, audio recordings of him. Uh, the, the, the difficult part is most of the video and audio is him performing as Walt Disney, you know, hi. You know, here we are in the middle of Tomorrowland, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but, and so that gives, a, gives you a certain sort of cadence and a sort of posture in the way he fills out a silhouette. But uh, getting into the more conversational aspect of it, there, there was enough there in order for me just to find how he talks to Tommy. But most of it turned out to be you know, fabulous anecdotal stories and information from, from Richard and from some, a number of other people who, 
who knew him extremely well. So it was just, a, it, it's just grunt work, to tell you the truth. It's just, you know, you just got, it's like coal mining. You just- You grunted where, very well, you know, Tom. Where, where, do you, where are you going today? I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to turn, I'm going to put some discs in the slot and I'm going to start with a pen and I'm just going to listen to as much as I can. And you're, it's like, it's like panning for gold. We, uh, we were done a great service by, by being allotted a certain amount of time and a certain amount of space to just be on our own and tell uh, the, the backstory that's reflected to time and time again in sequence. And, and it, was, it was kind of paradise. We were on a, we were on a bluff in, in Simi Valley overlooking uh, just scorched earth for miles. No telephone cables, no airplanes passing over, one horse, six chickens. Me and Ruth Wilson, a beautiful storyline that was never too far from being heartachingly painful, but at the same time, never completely took the other foot out from the world of hope also. I mean, you, I, I think as an actor, you always have carte blanche because you always have choice as to what bits of information you choose to use and draw from and what bits you choose to leave on the side or let history reevaluate at a later stage outside of the film process. For me, I, I just really had Kelly's wonderful script. And I had, uh, every time the film goes back to Travers and, and, and Ginty and the missus and the kids, uh, it's, it's a very particular time in their lives. It's a very particular time in the, in, the, in the regression or the disintegration of the marriage or of his health. So it was very clear. I kind of had a, a great understanding based on Kelly's beautiful writing of where Travers was and, and how he was being chopped down both physically and emotionally, by his, sadly, by his own existence and, and, and all the good fortune and the fact that he couldn't feel any of it. Well, I think any time you're going, you're going back and forth between two different time periods, you have to look kind of tonally and thematically at what you're leaving and what you're coming to to make sure there's a, a, a marriage bridge there, if you will. So uh, from a palette standpoint, certainly. Um, we shot on film with anamorphic lenses, um, most specifically because I wanted to capture the wide open spaces of, of Australia. But we also used a lot of devices, you know, thank, thank you, John Ford, a lot of framing devices. Um, every time, almost every time you see young Genty, and sometimes PL, it's through, a, through either a window. You notice a lot of the times uh, when she's talking with her father, she's outside looking through a window. There's a storybook element to that visually. Um, and, and it was always going to be difficult because this was not just 1961 and 1906, you come to find in the script, which is a, a, a fantastic thing when you're reading it, and all of a sudden you go, wow, because it's brand new information you don't often see in movies where um, these are strands of time that are kind of interwoven in a way. Um, and these are memories of hers. And you get to the point where you realize that 1961 is intruding on the memories of 1906, even to the mm -hmm. point that you know, this, this fine gentleman's lyrics are put in the word into the mouth of her father giving a speech. So well done by that. I must say that was an amazing piece of cinema, cinematic you. magic. But it, it, oh, thank you, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, uh, but, but that adds a, you know, a new conundrum in a way. Um, and, and, and so then you start to think about you know, maybe perhaps she's not completely reliable in terms of these memories. And you start to think that childhood memories are stylized and idealized. It's very much like Rachel Griffiths when we were talking about it. And I said, I want you coming in and your feet are in first position and the carpet bag is held thusly and the umbrella is like this, just like Mary Poppins. Mm -hmm. And she said that you're not looking for any reality here. And I said, no, and I explained it to her. And she said, I know what you're talking about. She said, when I was a child, had an uncle that I swore was seven feet tall mm -hmm. and the most handsome man in the world. And then he went away, um, he, he left and, and traveled the world and came back and he was five foot nine and a <laughs> bore. But in, her, but in her mind, looking up to him, he said he filled a, he filled a doorway. So there was you know, some of those kind of things, not that they're inaccurate, it's just a, a childlike memory. Does the movie that the movie's about factor into how you prepared your actors? Did you show the film before you started production? Was it important that you consider it, or did you want to set it aside? I mean, did you guys look at the film? Colin, got, Colin had to go over to his gaff and what, showed what it. Was the, oh, you showed it? I did, yeah. I, everyone came over, and, and we put it on, and, and sat outside and had a meal first, and then about three hours into the evening, everyone was getting on so well. I thought, well, it'll be a bit of a bad idea to put the film on now, but I thought that was the original idea anyway, so I should yeah. follow things through. Seeing as I tend not to in life, it was an easy <laughs> opportunity to go against the grain, so to speak. So I turned it on in the living room and turned the volume up, and within about 20 minutes, there was 20 of us in the living room sitting on the floor and on the couch and watching Mary Poppins and... Yeah. Having a cuddle. Wow, that sounds like Spooning. a great idea. And how did that affect uh, performance? The or only your, reason your why mindset? the film works, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> 
Tom, I'm wondering, uh, as an actor, to be actually on the lot, to be on the Disney lot, to be in the same offices um, that Walt, I don't know if, it, if you had the exact same office or? I, I once had an office there a long time ago, uh, and as uh, in costume and everything, I went in to find my old office to discover that it <clears throat> had been uh, turned into a, a storage room. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and, and uh, the wall had been knocked down and there was an ugly conference room there and a group of people, I walked in on a group of people and uh, they kind of looked at me and they said, ah, there you are. <laughs> and I said, yeah, hey, I'm Walt Disney now. What's, what are you guys having a meeting about? He says, uh, uh, potential DVD revenues. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I approve. <laughs> Uh, uh, that, that, that was it. It, it was, it was um, honestly, it was magical. And we, an awful lot of people made sure they walked by where we were shooting in order to get a look at everything that was going on there. John, he's not, Thomas Newman is not here, but I want to hear a little bit about your ideas for music. Music is obviously a central component of the story. What did you seek to do in terms of score and how that was set apart from the film itself, the music in the film? We had a lot of discussions. He's, you know, a brilliant guy, and he, he loved uh, many talks with Richard, but also taking the music that was in the film that Richard and his brother wrote, and then somehow finding that family for your, theme is, for your themes as well, I think, was, was important to him. There's a, you know, there's an interesting thing. I'm going to give Thomas credit for this, too. We did the pre-records. Remember, we were at Capitol Records, mm -hmm. and you're in there, and you're recording all the voices and the actors singing and the piano stuff, and we had 20 extra minutes after the actors had been cut loose, and we had Walt Disney's piano, one of his pianos that he owned in one of his houses, and it was a rehearsal piano, one of the flat back ones. So it doesn't sound great. It's a mm -hmm. rehearsal piano, but we had it there, and Randy Kirby was, uh, I think it's Randy Kirby's his name, brilliant pianist, was there. So we've got 20 minutes, you want to do anything? And I said, you know what, just because I know I'm going to need it for a track, play Chim Chimmery one note at a time as simply and as hauntingly as you can. Mm -hmm. And so he did a couple of takes of that, and it was beautiful because it ends up being kind of like name that tune. You hear a note and another note, and then by the time you get to the third or fourth, you go, I know what that is. And so it ended up you know, working for the, for the, for the bookends. Um, but it was funny, I never, I never thought that it would necessarily be in the movie, but I got fonder and fonder of it as we kept working on it. And then um, I asked Tom, said, are you going to keep the, the piano at the start and the end? And I said, um, I, said I don't know, I'm going to leave it. What do you think? I thought, you know, if you want to put score in there, you can do it. And he said, I would leave it. He said, I think it's perfect. And he said, the other thing, you're going to have a thousand people tell you to re-record it on a, on a Steinway or something. Mm -hmm. And he said, I hear, because you hear the mechanics of the piano, mm -hmm. you hear it in there. And he said, don't, please don't take it out. He said, because this is the movie that's about the creative process and the work that goes into a finished product. And he goes, I love hearing Walt Disney's piano work hard to make these notes. Mm. Well, there, there was a, a degree of, of negotiation that had to go into a couple of tricky things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Walt Disney died. He smoked three packs a day, and he died of lung cancer. It's, mm -hmm. Um, and how do we show that? And the truth is, if we had shown Walt Disney putting a cigarette in his mouth and lighting it and taking a drag, it would be an R-rated movie, <clears throat> which would have been contrary to, I think, an awful lot of uh, the, the spirit of the film <clears throat> uh, in the first place. Uh, but then there's ways in order we <laughs> we figured out, literally one day at the desk, it says, as long as we only see you putting the cigarette out... <laughs> That will rate as smoking. I said, okay, I get it. So just tell me when. And it was literally like, and action. Oh, hey, don't let anybody see me doing this. But then we had from another of and the great anecdotal information we had that uh, was that everybody knew, you know, that everybody's been to the animation building over at Disney with those long hallways. Mm -hmm. So that everybody knew when Walt was coming to the meeting because they would hear him clearing his throat and coughing down by the first, mm -hmm. by the first door. And that's, that's, that, wow. that's in the film. Um, so there, there's ways in that you just try, have to figure out sort of like you have to game against the system in mm -hmm. order to get as many of those small little details in. And the fact is, he enjoyed a scotch mist at uh, about 5 o'clock in the <laughs> afternoon. In a way, I'm a little bit prejudiced because of the fact that uh, Mrs. Travers really left a very bad feeling with me and my brother Bob and Don DeGrotti. <laughs> she, she, she did. I mean, she used, this one over here used to say, excuse me, I have to be a bitch to you now. And she'd go out <laughs> and, and she'd play a scene and then she'd come back again. But in all truth, Mrs. Travers was a very wounded little girl. 
She, and, and Kelly brought that out beautifully. Had I known, truly, her backstory, I, I would have had a lot more understanding of everything, but I used to come home uh, just a drenched rag. I was just absolutely destroyed. <laughs> everything I dreamed, I, the beautiful stuff we'd written, she just uh, pushed it aside and you know insulted us. And one day we were sitting, DeGrati, Bob, and myself, and Mrs. Travers, at, at a lunch table, and we're having lunch, and she says, of course, you Americans, you have no respect for your leaders. So we, what, what? And she, she said, you have no respect for Winston, for example. Never so many have sold so much for so few. And she started quoting Winston Churchill. She referred to him as Winston. <laughs> and, I, and so DeGrati and Bob and I looked at each other, and, and we started saying, four score and seven years ago. <laughs> Our fathers brought forth on this, and we went through the entire Gettysburg Address from beginning to end. And at the last thing, shall not perish from the earth. And then we just looked at her and she said, hmm. She was lovable. <laughs>